someone boots up a Pokemon game for the first time, it's truly a magical moment. For most Pokemon players, this happened when we were just kids. Excited but blissfully unaware, we're greeted by a kindly professor who informs us we're about to embark on an epic adventure into the world of Pokemon. We proceed to name our character, talk to our in-game mom, and meet up with the professor to receive our first partner Pokemon. For many, this moment becomes etched into their mind as a permanent memory. For me, it was Pokemon Red version on my fat, gray, original Game Boy. However, there's another moment I'll never forget. One that changed the way I will play Pokemon forever. And it starts right here in Ruby and Sapphire. Oh, just hold on one second. You see, most people assume that the attributes of a Pokemon the game gives you are based on luck. Let's say, for example, you wanted to play through the game using a shiny Pokemon. For those unaware, shiny Pokemon are an ultra rare occurrence featuring an alternate color palette and a unique sparkle animation. The odds of receiving one can be as low as 1 in 8192. To play through the game with a shiny starter, the player would need to either be extremely lucky or reset the game over and over in the face of incredible odds. This can take days, weeks, or even months of repetitive effort. However, this isn't the only method for acquiring a shiny starter Pokemon, and I'll show you what I mean right now. Two, three, four, five, six. Hey, look at that, we did it. Clearly, that wasn't luck. I didn't have to mindlessly reset my game for days on end. Instead, I just performed what's known as an RNG manipulation. Now, if you're a shiny hunter, you may have spent hundreds of your own precious limited hours on this earth in order to accomplish what I've demonstrated here in just a few minutes. You may already know about RNG manipulation and feel like it's cheating. I can understand why accepting RNG manipulation as legitimate might feel invalidating for the countless hours of effort you've put in. There's a persistent reputation around RNG manipulated shinies being not real, less valuable, or even just like hacking with extra steps. However, I urge you to keep an open mind. Shiny hunting relies on persistence, time, and luck in hopes of obtaining something perceived as incredibly rare and valuable. It's about testing your patience and resolve and being rewarded with something most players never experience, even after hundreds of hours of normal gameplay. Aw, damn it, we got a shiny. In contrast, learning about RNG puts agency back in the player's hands. It becomes like a puzzle game, relying on game knowledge, problem solving, and execution. It's science, taking things apart in order to gain a deeper understanding of fundamental principles, and using that knowledge to make the impossible possible. Compared to traditional methods, finding a shiny with RNG like this might seem relatively easy. But when I started, this process was confusing, intimidating, and difficult. Fed up with unsuccessfully resetting my game over and over, I originally sought RNG as a shortcut to shiny Pokemon. Instead, I found my patience and skill challenged in ways no other game ever has. Unknowingly, I'd taken my first step on a new Pokemon adventure, a new way to play the game with its own unique difficulties testing my determination. Once I'd mastered the basics, quickly getting a shiny had indeed become easy, but I found myself wanting more, and time and time again the world of RNG presented me with more complex compelling Pokemon puzzles. It unlocked a new frontier of fantastic feats which absolutely blew my mind eight years ago, and sent me barreling down a near bottomless rabbit hole I may never climb out of. So what makes this all possible? Well, the answer lies in the mechanism all video games use to simulate luck, the pseudo-random number generator, or RNG for short. Since computers perform operations logically using ones and zeros, they struggle to produce results that are truly random. So, programmers developed sequences of complex math operations called RNG algorithms to create the illusion of luck. Pokemon is no exception. While every game in the series has its own quirks, some level of RNG manipulation is possible using nothing but original hardware, access to a computer, and in some cases a way to view the game's video output via a camera or capture device. Ruby and Sapphire is where it all started for me, and explaining how exactly I was able to manipulate this shiny starter Pokemon should establish the fundamentals of how it all works and what's possible once you master these skills. See, in these games, the pool of Pokemon available for you to encounter is determined by a four-digit hex number called the RNG Seed. This value is set upon booting the game, and it's determined by the state of the in-game clock in Ruby and Sapphire. This clock keeps time even when the game isn't on, and it does so by having a physical battery inside the cartridge. However, this battery can die, and for original cartridges from back in 2002, this happened long ago. 
When it does, you're greeted by this message on the title screen. The internal battery has run dry. The game can be played, however, plot-based events will no longer occur. Indeed, the game can be played, and in fact, this battery being dead is critical for being able to manipulate Ruby and Sapphire's RNG. See, once the battery is dead, the clock stops and becomes frozen at midnight January 1st, 2000, resulting in the initial RNG seed of 5A0. A constant initial seed means that all the Pokemon you encounter are perfectly predictable. Since the GBA games run at approximately 60 frames per second, each frame lasts for a mere 16.66 milliseconds. Every frame has a specific set of Pokemon data associated with it. Species, stats, nature, and even shininess are predetermined and thus capable of manipulation. The only catch is that you need to be frame perfect, which means being able to accurately hit that 16.66 millisecond window. This might sound frustrating and infeasible, but thankfully special timers have been developed with rhythmic beeps to synchronize the player with the game. With a bit of practice, anyone can learn to become frame perfect and stop relying on luck. Frames are moving. I've calibrated a timer, a calculator, a fucking computer program around my game file, and now I have a timer that I press A with it. One, two, three, four, five, six! It's either shiny or not. Now, shiny Pokemon themselves are so rare because they rely on two separate values being a perfect match. The first is the Pokemon's Personality ID, or PID. This 8-digit hex number serves as the unique identifier for every individual frame of the RNG. The second is your full trainer ID number. I say full because the 5 digits you see on your trainer card are only half of your full ID. The other half is normally hidden from the player and is another 5-digit number we call the secret ID. When the trainer ID and secret ID are combined, they can be converted to an 8-digit hex number just like PID. And when the personality ID, trainer ID, and secret ID are crossed using a programming operation known as bitwise exclusive or, they produce something akin to a remainder between 0 and 65,535. For generations 3 through 5, if this remainder is less than 8, the Pokemon will appear as shiny in-game. Thus, we get the odds of any Pokemon being shiny as 8 in 65,536, or simplified as 1 in 8,192. As an interesting side note, starting in Generation 6, the threshold was actually raised to 16, and thus, shiny rates were doubled to 1 in 4096. So why did I pause to press A at a specific time during the professor's intro sequence? Because I was using the timer to aim for a very specific trainer ID and secret ID. Ruby and Sapphire are unique in that the RNG uses the exact same process to determine your trainer ID as it does to determine a Pokemon's PID. Given what we now know about how shiny Pokemon are determined, you might have already guessed that when your full trainer ID and a Pokemon's PID match exactly, the XOR remainder value is zero and thus the Pokemon appears shiny. For this to work, all I needed to do was reboot my game, start the timer, and claim my starter Pokemon on the exact same frame that determined my trainer ID, thus completing the match and yielding my new shiny Trico, who by the way has two perfect IVs. But that's nothing compared to what RNG manipulation is truly capable of. From the beginning, a core part of the Pokemon series has been battling Pokemon with your friends. For most, this aspect of the game begins and ends with the Pokemon you've caught and raised along your adventure. Up until this point, the only thing that mattered were levels and super effective attacks. However, should you develop a desire to learn the intricacies of competitive battling, you'll quickly discover that not all Pokemon are created equal. Every Pokemon has six hidden stats ranging from 0 to 31, which influence their maximum potential stats. We call these individual values, or IVs for short. At the highest levels of competition, anything less than perfect could mean the difference between going first and securing a KO, or surviving a super effective hit with just enough HP to strike back. The odds of naturally encountering a perfect Pokemon like this put the 1 in 8192 shiny odds to shame. Each IV has a 1 in 32 chance of being perfect. A Pokemon typically only relies on either attack or special attack for damage. Thus, at least 5 of those IVs need to be perfect. So, we take 32 to the 5th power and find the odds. 1 in 33 million 554,432, but that's not all. Each Pokemon can also have one of 25 natures, which boosts one stat's maximum potential by 10% and lowers another's. As such, there's typically one specific nature that's optimal for a competitive Pokemon, and so the true odds must be multiplied by 25. One 
in 838,860,800. Now, there are systems in game to circumvent some of this insanity. By breeding Pokemon with perfect stats together, you can yield offspring with better odds of being perfect. However, some Pokemon cannot be bred, and even under ideal circumstances, a player would need to hatch tens of thousands of eggs before seeing even one considered perfect for competitive play. Understandably, in recent years, Game Freak has made obtaining Pokemon like this a little easier, but the history of competitive Pokemon goes back to the very beginning. When forced to confront the difficulty of acquiring such Pokemon, most players would opt to never make the leap into competitive play. However, Pokemon itself is one of the most fun and complex turn-based games ever designed. Naturally, dedicated players would desire a competitive scene to test their skills. And so, uninterested in wasting precious months of their lives mindlessly hatching eggs and resetting over and over, they would instead turn to game sharks, action replays, and save editors. Creating perfect Pokemon for themselves and thus establishing cheating as a necessary evil in order to compete at the highest level. A practice which persists to produce problems in the Pokemon player base up to the present day. Some people, however, would fundamentally reject cheating as the norm and instead seek methods to remove luck from the equation without altering the game's normal function. It was from this desire that back in the golden age of DS Wi-Fi battling forums and chat rooms, that the RNG community was born. It's truly ironic then that since its inception, RNG manipulation has endured being branded as cheating by much of the greater Pokemon community. It's a method for overcoming the astronomical barrier to entry for playing Pokemon competitively, without cheating or hacking. It was born out of our desire to battle Pokemon at the highest level, using Pokemon we actually invested time and energy into acquiring. Easier shiny hunting was simply a byproduct of this effort. And yet, much like shiny hunters, I've spent days or even weeks attempting insanely difficult RNG manipulations for what I see as a legitimately acquired Pokemon, only to be met with comments like, might as well have just hacked it in and save yourself the trouble. Obviously, I don't see it this way. Game Freak created one of the most unique and interesting gaming experiences I've ever had, completely by accident. They unknowingly gave purpose and focus to not only me, but an entire community of talented people who love Pokemon. An ever-growing tower of knowledge, built up brick by brick by players so passionate about the game, they read the code line by line. When a new game is released, it's not game journalists or YouTube personalities who uncover the in-depth details about what makes the game tick. Instead, each generation, data miners and programmers cooperate in a labor of love, meticulously poking and prodding to reverse engineer how the game systems function, developing tools to calculate seeds, predicting potential Pokemon, and simplifying the execution of RNG manipulation. Their efforts even inspired me to learn a bit of programming just so I could create a tool to make Fire Red and Leaf Green a little bit less frustrating. The RNG community even crosses international borders and language barriers, one of the most comprehensive documents I've ever seen on Pokemon data structures lives on a French paste bin. Some of the most extensive documentation for 3DS era RNG lives on an Italian speaking forum. Some of the most niche and interesting tools for games like Colosseum and XD Gale of Darkness came from Japanese developers keeping blogs of their progress. Thanks to these amazing people, even Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, and Legends Arceus have methods for RNG manipulating Pokemon. With the new generation of Scarlet and Violet on the horizon, you might be itching to pick up your favorite Pokemon game one more time in anticipation. If you do, consider doing something new and give RNG manipulation a try. Whether you want to capture a shiny Arceus for your collection, craft a team of competitive shinies from scratch, or simply enjoy playing through Heart Gold with a shiny starter, there's never been a better time to join this wonderful corner of the Pokemon community. Sincerely, thank you from the bottom of my heart for watching this video all the way to the end. I know it's been at least two months, maybe three since my last upload, but I'm back. And thanks to the help of my good friend Blissey, this video finally saw the light of day. Uh, I'm going to be streaming on Twitch live immediately following this video premiere. And I will now be streaming every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday starting at 3 p.m. So I look forward to seeing you guys there. And there are way more videos in the future. Sincerely, thank you, thank you, thank you, and I hope to see you again soon. Click like and subscribe if you haven't already. Peace.